Welcome, everyone. We know the sign of a superstar when the auditorium is like this, which is really, really exciting. Um, welcome to the inaugural lecture of the semester. I'm thrilled to have with us Shohei Shigematsu to present the recent work of OMA New York, of which he has been leading partner since 2006. I first met Sho in 1999. He was then working at OMA Rotterdam, where I was just starting. The office at the time felt like the island in the series Lost, set up seemingly, I know probably it's too old for you guys, but <laughs> those of us Gen X might remember, set up seemingly in the middle of nowhere, yet attracting a high concentration of young, hungry, and ambitious architectural talent from around the world. At once a stage for the fiercest competition and the biggest black-dressed egos, OMA was also an incredible place where collegiality, collaboration, odd forms of mentorship, and lifelong friendships formed almost instantly, as if to overcome the feeling of being nothing but cogs in a brilliant wheel intent on changing the course of architecture. The very few of us who stood out always seemed to be trying too hard, but not show. Sure. From my first days in the office, his elegant and unwavering coolness, which he combined with a uniquely dry sense of humor, rendered his presence special and with its own aura. Show was running a small team, working on a cinémathèque in Almer, a new town in the Netherlands. It wasn't one of the star projects in the office around which chaos, chaos usually reigned, and we didn't know much about it. But you could see Sho and his team diligently just working with no drama, but with great discipline, just chipping away in the shadows of the office. Until one day, we all walked in to see the most incredible red resin model, exquisitely beautiful building. There it was sitting, one of the most interesting projects in the office at the time, succeeding in working within a given approach and architectural language while also inventing what became a seminal new section type for the office, the ice cream sandwich of mass void mass, which exuded the kind of mysterious beauty that OMA's best projects have uniquely produced over the past decades. It is in reflecting on Sho's amazing trajectory from junior designer at OMA to partner in charge of some of the firm's most exciting current work that I was reminded of his, this first encounter, which shed some light on why or how Sho is today, today succeeding where many before him have failed. Since taking the leadership of OMA New York, he has transformed the office from an outpost to the main office in Rotterdam to a full-blown creative design firm with an increasingly complex and autonomous identity. From the Fena Arts District in Miami Beach to the Quebec National Beaux-Arts Museum, the Audrey Irmas Pavilion in Los Angeles, the numerous collaborations with artists such as Sai Guo Chang, Marina Abramovic, or Kanye West, as well as the design of the World Traveling Prada exhibition, Ways Down, the design for the Costume Institute Spring 2016 exhibition at the Met Manus Ex Machina, fashion in the age of technologies, in technology design, and of course, the long-awaited new museum expansion, Cho's leadership of OMA New York is demonstrating his capacity to provide continuity with the firm's body of work, but also to open up new avenues for its future in terms of the types of projects, but also in terms of concern and sensibility. Those concerns are still urban, but today they reflect those of his generation and our time. Cho is leading the design of a new civic center in Bogota, Colombia, a post-Hurricane Sandy urban water strategy for New Jersey, and a food hub in Louisville, Kentucky, featuring a diversity of programs that reflect the full food chain, as well as a new foodscape of public spaces and plazas where producers and consumers meet. The strong sense of a generational shift in terms of conditions, typology, program scale, but also concerns and ideas is one that Cho has expressed repeatedly for OMA New York and its future. In a recent interview, he stated, quote, my journey is starting now. That is quite an understatement for someone who has already achieved so much. We are excited to have him tonight on the eve of what, of what is yet to come. 
Please welcome Shu Shigematsu. Thank you. Um, it's an uh, honor to be speaking at the, the first lecture of the semester. And it's really a, a bit, I'm nervous because, you know, someone like Danwood and Michael Rock, who actually mentored me uh, in the beginning of OMA period, is sitting in front of me. So it's a bit of a strange moment where I see a lot of ex-OMA colleagues uh, in front of me. The trick is that uh, a lot of good people leave OMA. Uh, <laughs> and some bad people stay. And uh, I just hanged on to my position, uh, knowing my capacity. Um, that's how it worked. Um, this is a project I uh, worked with Amal and Michael Rock and Dan Wood. It was the UN city next to UN. Uh, still, this site is empty. It's kind of amazing. It was 2000, year 2000. Um, it was a really incredible collaboration with KPF, Toyo Ito, OMA, and Davis Brody Bond. Uh, this was maybe my first uh, encounter to New York City. Um, now I, would, I owe you maybe an explanation of how OMA is evolving. Uh, right now it's three major offices, Rotterdam, Hong Kong, New York. Uh, this is maybe a diagram that is, uh, um, we put some energy on. Um, so OMA as uh, a collective, hi Susan, um, uh, was, it, uh, was started as a collective uh, and as you know after REM took over uh, as a kind of singular uh, uh, person, uh, architect, then it spawned so many different uh, great architecture firms. Uh, but I'm the first generation because I stayed that I had to compete with all these kind of great uh, uh, second uh, generation out of OMA. So that made me really think how OMA should actually evolve because, you know, of course OMA was known as an established office, but at the same time I had to compete with great young energy and new ideas that also went through the same kind of process of learning at OMA. So it was a very tough competition. So somehow, uh, magically, right now, how OMA is evolving is not really a kind of cent centric incubator model, but we are incubating uh, each partners within the office so that we don't create any more competitors outside OMA. <laughs> um, so uh, me and Jason is uh, basically leading New York office, but basically everyone is uh, working on their own uh, direction and hopefully this will create a, a kind of unique um, um, architecture firm that uh, also has individuality within the collect collective uh, uh, brand. New York office has about 70 people doing uh, multiple projects. Uh, because it's an academic environment, I just wanted to kind of outline how we work. I think our architecture always exists between the observation, general observation, our uh, obsession, and basically a representation. So architecture is always somewhere between the kind of final outcome and the kind of very abstract general observation. Um, I also think we are the kind of uh, uh, generation that has highly uh, uh, affected by the kind of culture of observation that venture in. Uh, uh, Scott Brown has introduced, and I think REM actually really did learn from them uh, how to be specific and how to uh, have general observation of the change that are happening in the world, and then basically uh, escalate that into an architecture. Uh, so it's not really a linear process, but those uh, different uh, obs since, uh, observation to the representation creates a kind of a depth where we, our architecture can exist. And architecture doesn't really limit itself to a physical architecture, but it could be books, writing, or diagrams that could influence the industry. So this is the research, uh, how we create the kind of environment of uh, uh, really understanding the context, formal exploration. This is something that is misunderstood about OMA is that we really care about the beauty and the form, uh, not just diagram and the clarity. Uh, but so this laborious uh, process actually really uh, kind of uh, feed, uh, feed the uh, initial research back. So it's not just a kind of formal exploration after a diagram, but the formal, if the formal exploration is not successful, actually we 
uh, think back the uh, premise of the concept. Uh, and a very simple, uh, basically, a representation of uh, uh, the manipulation we are doing to uh, each project. Uh, and the outcome of the uh, basically model, we also use model as a uh, communication device. This is the Marina's model where we had a, a central space, had a, a different window types. So we made a, a model that you can put your head inside and that became Marina's a kind of perform, a performance device. Uh, this was a model we made for the Lucas Cultural Art Museum for George Lucas, we kind of challenged him by making a film at the outcome uh, of the competition, which he kind of immediately kind of felt offended, I think. We, were, we thought this kind of handheld kind of uh, movement was cool, so we kind of superimposed these diagrams into the film. I know you get quite kind of seasick, because of this bad handheld uh, camera. As you might know, this was a project in Chicago where uh, George Lucas's wife kind of single-handedly promised with the mayor to give this parking lot next to the Soldier Stadium. So it was a unique condition when, even when we started the competition, um, the, there was already a protest because it was a public land. So our concept was to bring the gallery up uh, and create a kind of uh, um, winter garden at the top so that uh, the tailgating parking lot is preserved. So this was also our attempt to actually use the model and mix the media. So the model, uh, we made the model for this uh, film and then superimposed uh, the, uh, basically the movement and content inside. Anyway, I don't think uh, George Lucas actually finished watching it, so I will not. I will not finish this film. Uh, 2007, there was a kind of project that we worked on and still uh, really a pity that uh, this didn't happen. It was a, a residential project next to this one Madison Park, which was already built when we started to work on, we were commissioned to work on this smaller one that uh, gives the lobby and the screening room at the bottom. Uh, because this tower was already built, uh, we, the developer had the air rights and the uh, FAR to build this much, as blue shows. Uh, but uh, the developer also already sold the units here, so they didn't want to block the view to the south. So what we did was to basically sway away from the tower to provide a view to the south, but also by swaying to the east, you could provide a view to the uh, Madison Square Park. Uh, and bring the light to the uh, uh, residential unit uh, below, which became basically a kind of typical New York typology, but upside down. So it looked like a normal building, or it looked like a, a shy child behind the parents, or a straight tower, and it shows its entirety from the south. Um, so this was a project, and this was a kind of structural diagram. It went from punched window to more uh, transparent uh, uh, curtain wall uh, as, the, as at, the, at the center you needed more structure so that basically the facade represented the structural force. Uh, we thought it was kind of an upturn uh, moment that this was going to be built. We actually finished CD drawings and then somehow downturn hit it uh, hit and actually uh, this got cancelled. So of course this form has an upturn shape and a downturn shape. <laughs> um, but ironically we now got the uh, project in the same street, actually like a couple of blocks away. That's the tower that we were working uh, with. Uh, so this is at the corner of Lexington and 23rd that we wanted to represent this kind of uh, dual identity of 
uh, uh, Madison Square Park or Gramercy Park. This location is some, sits somewhere in between, so the corner actually represents this kind of instability of the identity that this corner had. Uh, and stitching these two streets together by creating this kind of three-dimensional uh, corner and creating an uh, interesting reflection of the streets and open corner. This was a kind of very tight zoning restriction where uh, in New York uh, there's a street wall restriction, but I wrote, uh, interestingly, the corner, because of the corner articulation of the traditional architecture, there is a, a kind of loophole to actually articulate the corner uh, uh, which you can't really do on the street facade, so which we use that uh, loophole to design this corner. Uh, the facade also moves from punched window to more open uh, because two, two other buildings next doors uh, were kind of you know, interesting building and then had the punched window, so it's kind of being contextual. Uh, there's also 22nd Street side, which uh, creates an entrance that has a kind of unstable grid and then Oasis' uh, big courtyard that uh, uh, hugs uh, existing buildings and then creates amenities that uh, uh, basically is, uh, faces these, this uh, um, central space. Um, we also work a lot on uh, public space nowadays. As you know, Highline uh, attracts more people than architecture nowadays. And as you know, uh, it uh, is replicated everywhere in the world. I was inspired by uh, Mr. Scofidio's comment about this is not architecture, uh, because I felt during the recession that uh, we were in danger by landscape architects because they could actually provide improvements without building. And I thought uh, this statement actually is not really kind of, uh, 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 was not feeling that kind of danger. So I thought uh, doing something very different from Highline when we got the project to do something similar, which was a bridge park in DC that connects Anacostia, which is the low income area, to a proper DC side. Uh, typically, of course, the bridge actually uh, goes up uh, gently to cr uh, create a clearance uh, uh, below, but we continued uh, uh, further to create an X, a kind of symbolic X in the central space uh, where the two, uh, plate, two plates meet. So if you're coming from one side, it creates a gateway, and you know, on the other side, you can actually create a program underneath. Uh, so you create this kind of X bridge, and you can have a view uh, from the higher vantage point back to the city. Uh, also, this is a kind of uh, up, uh, basically a vertical representation of L'Enfant's uh, 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 DC grid. So basically, all these uh, big uh, skewed X's, as you know in DC, where a special moment happens, special building are there. So we thought this is a kind of interesting representation of that grid uh, and creating a program around it, such as Performance Cafe and Plaza. So it's more like a Rialto bridge, but a bit more kind of funkier, uh, and have uh, this kind of uh, program. And structurally, it also works. Uh, and um, also, this is the water is not so clean, so we created this kind of filtration demonstration that we project the kind of uh, storytelling of the Anacostia's uh, culture or the history onto the water. Uh, and this is the, uh, the summertime, the winter time, and because, uh, um, um, because the uh, um, Pentagon is close and the airport is close, uh, we simulated the Air Force One. Uh, we thought that the city of monument, this can't really be a, a kind of strong monument because it's so skinny, but we thought uh, it could actually <laughs> get to a $10 bill because it, of course, X means 10, so you can actually make a, a new bill. Um, we also recently did the bridge in Mexico. Uh, this is Godzilla. Because I'm from Japan, I'm actually really keen on uh, a natural disaster and how the, <laughs> the keen as in not like enjoying, like I'm really <laughs> observing. Uh, the natural disaster. You know Godzilla is not really a, a kind of fantasy because for Japanese people it's a representation of this natural series of natural disasters. Uh, 
Um, so in Mexico, uh, there was a, a earthquake in September 19th, like basically two years ago, uh, close to Mexico City, and this uh, city of Jojutla was uh, heavily damaged. There is a, an entity in Mexico, Infonavit, that uh, basically pr uh, provides social housing and also uh, uh, disaster relief, basically recovery from the disaster. So we were invited to do something here. We decided to not to do the housing because there are a lot of great architects who are already working on the uh, uh, housing. So we decided to do a bridge uh, because this river, uh, of course, flooded heavily uh, also and also was uh, used to be a kind of infrastructure of the city, but now completely neglected. Um, so we took this point where the, the river actually uh, winds like this. Uh, it's like this, like middle of nowhere. Uh, no kind of interest uh, to the river uh, life or waterfront because city is basically shuts off uh, the grid to the river. So this was a kind of uh, intent to create a connection uh, between two different sides, which was demolished by the earthquake, but also to create a kind of single axis that uh, uh, really focuses on uh, a central boulevard connecting uh, into the uh, two sides. So this, this is basically where the heaviest uh, demol demolition, uh, destruction uh, occurred. So we thought that we can actually connect this area to the other side, but back to the other side so that you can actually create this kind of uh, continuation of the street, but also uh, make people realize that uh, the river is an amenity to the city. There was a, a heavy kind of budget restriction, so we decided to use something uh, off the shelf. <laughs> uh, not really this is off the shelf, but something already kind of engineered. Uh, there was a budget to do a 100 meter bridge plus two public space. Uh, we decided not to do this kind of public plaza because we couldn't really find a space for it. Instead, we decided to actually elongate the plaza as long as the bridge. So in, in short, basically, it's a double-decker bridge, uh, like an I-beam, that you have two levels, uh, like this. Uh, because there are 100-year uh, flood and also maybe potentially even heavier flood that could happen, so we thought it could be beneficial to have two datum and also daily use and more kind of quiet, uh, slow use at the top. Uh, of course, uh, it's an off-the-shelf I-beam, so we studied uh, kind of potential openings so that it could create uh, different activities between two sides. Uh, this was the kind of best we could do uh, with some variation of the size uh, and uh, some openings so that you can go from one side to the other. Uh, so you have this double-decker. Uh, and uh, but at the at the kind of middle of the project, uh, they said this uh, space is of course privately owned, so you can't really stroke a single line. So we bent the bridge, which I think it could uh, it looked uh, better in the end. Uh, so this is the bridge that we are uh, hoping that it will be built soon. Um, the museum extension, because we're doing some museums, I want to show you uh, a couple of, uh, of them. Uh, as you know, museum is doomed to extend, so this is Corbu's uh, response to that uh, fate by uh, allowing the typology itself, architecture itself, to uh, extend uh, endlessly. Uh, there, of course, there is a kind of uh, lot of extensions happening right now in the world. As you know, uh, addition can be autonomous or competitive, like in MoMA, seamless. You, don't, you no longer know what's uh, original and what's ad added. Uh, or Guggenheim, which uh, the addition is completely kind of subservient. Uh, this is one of the, my first project that uh, worked on in New York with, with Dan. Uh, it was uh, Whitney, at the time, Whitney Extension. When we started, there was an infamous proposal from Michael Graves uh, being canceled. Uh, and uh, what we did was not to actually demolish the brownstone in front, but to launch the building from the courtyard of the brownstone and then loom over and have enough space between the uh, Breuer building. Uh, of course, you, I said uh, um, Michael Graves' one is infamous, but this also became infamous. 
uh, and got canceled. And even Renzo Piano took over, but uh, he couldn't even finish uh, this edition in Upper East Side, as you know, hence uh, Whitney, uh, Whitney moved to downtown. Um, there is, of course, uh, um, there is not, of course, but there is a, a conspiracy theory that uh, Renzo Piano and OMA is the same office uh, <laughs> because we always start and he takes over, um, which is not true. But I hope it was true. But um, so now uh, Karen uh, Wan is here, the deputy director of New Museum. So we are uh, blessed to actually do the same uh, kind of extension to a very, uh, of course, iconic architecture in Bowery. Uh, new Museum. So our site is here. Uh, new Museum, as you know, is not, as, as any other new, uh, museum entities nowadays, they have variety of activities like Idea City, New Inc., it's an incubator, and not just an uh, exhibition. Uh, so they carry a kind of diversity of uh, face. Uh, Bowery, as you know, is the uh, representation of gentrification, which of course instigated by the uh, new museum in the beginning. So we had to really address that uh, uh, issue too. Uh, I can't really show you the detail uh, at all, but uh, this is a site that the Sana building sits and our site was uh, skinnier and longer. So we thought even before designing what kind of relationship can exist because we had done so many uh, extensions and also I learned personally from the Whitney case that you cannot really overwhelm the existing but also you you have to provide different curatorial strategy etc uh, and of course new and old the two two addition of two buildings of course creates bad and worse or new and old you know this kind of dichotomy that is uh, of course uh, uh, dangerous so even before we started designing, we looked at, uh, we collected images that are representing maybe potentially interesting relationship like Marina and her uh, husband, where of course people has to go through in between, or a rocket launcher, that rocket and launcher, you know, you have different roles, but uh, works together. So in short, uh, this was an image that was released we made the gallery spaces that are aligned to uh, exactly to the existing building. Uh, basically, all the levels are uh, aligned, so the new ink uh, office and uh, the multifunctional room. But two things we added, uh, heavy uh, infrastructure at the back where another uh, freight elevator and uh, uh, other uh, infrastructure is. And then also in the, big, in the front, on the west side, as a kind of public face, uh, with a stair atrium and two dedicated gallery elevator uh, that really creates a public uh, movement visible, but also to create a sense of orientation while you're in the building. And that supports the existing building. Uh, because as you know, current building has a rather longer uh, waiting time to go up and down. Uh, so this was the image that was released. I think there was a kind of very harsh comments uh, to this uh, design. Um, but uh, we also created this kind of public plaza in between. Typically, any extension actually hides more of the existing building, but here, because we are creating this buffer, we are actually exposing more of the facade of the existing building. So this facade is currently not visible, but it, it will be. Uh, and then the two elevators that are visible and a public stair that is also vis visible and uh, some terraces that uh, are attached to an uh, upper function. You can see here uh, the, the, the profile of stack gallery, and uh, basically this is showing the public face. Um, we also wanted to <laughs> contrast itself to a vertical museum to a horizontal uh, museum. So here, because of the extreme setback from the street actually, the upper part really disappears and gives uh, respect to the Sana building. So it looks kind of highly uh, distinguished, but it's actually highly connected. Uh, I hope I can show you more uh, in the future. 
Um, we also did uh, other museum extensions. This was a, a museum extension in Quebec City. Uh, this was existing museum complex. This is a site that uh, the museum bought for the first time to have an interface to the public uh, street, the, uh, the boulevard, main boulevard. Um, and so what we did was to uh, create this kind of manipulation where you peel the ground and then basically three entities simultaneously extend, not just the museum. So the museum extend, but also so as park and so as city underneath. So you can see that the park continues above the museum and the city slides under. And the art becomes a catalyst between the uh, park and the city. Uh, so this is how uh, it's finished. You can see it's uh, next to the church. Um, these are the existing uh, museums. This was at the opening. So this is a grand hall where it creates a new uh, frontage to the city as an entrance. Uh, the ground level is almost like an extension of a street because it draws people inside to the column free space that is surrounded by courtyard, uh, cafe, the atrium, the shop, and the temporary gallery. So it really acts like a, a plaza because in Canada, the ha part, uh, half of the revenue should be made uh, not through the donation, but revenue should be made by using the building. So it really acts like an event space. So this is the, uh, the entrance that really looks into the park and also uh, it touches the church. So the church will be also part of the museum in the future. So actually this museum is attached to the church and the former prison uh, because the former prison was also converted to a museum. So it's kind of a dream job to design a building that is simultaneously connected to a church and the uh, prison. Um, so <laughs> this is the, um, uh, I'm just kind of uh, showing off my shaking hands moment <laughs> with Justin. Um, uh, so you can see this is a kind of public, uh, almost like a public plaza at the opening, but now you can see many dance, uh, music events, art installations, gala, another party, and even the wedding. So it's really used as we intended. Uh, there is a courtyard between the uh, church and the museum uh, that creates this kind of uh, uh, dialogue between the new and the old. This is a shop looking into the church. Uh, the circulation is also uh, matched or circulation itself creates this kind of a, a programmatic uh, um, a spine. So this is a monumental stair that really creates a, a serpentine stair that really distributes people from different direction. So this is a tunnel that connects to the existing uh, building which we used as a gallery space. Uh, so this is the auditorium. So this is a tunnel uh, that uh, exhibits this long, three longest mural that is uh, produced by the local Quebec artist. Uh, and in the gallery, a series of windows that really embraces the park. And this is a stair window we call where you go out of the envelope and creates this kind of moment that you're immersed with the, uh, nature. Uh, this, the facade is like triple glazed uh, glass. We wanted to create a kind of building that is quite open. Uh, so it brings a lot of natural light through the facade uh, and also it creates this kind of ice palace-like texture because the, the outer glass is uh, a textured glass. So you can see the building's uh, a facade changing with its uh, different light conditions throughout the day. Um, our Bright Knox uh, gallery extension is in Buffalo. Uh, as you might know, Buffalo was designed by Olmsted. It's a park system, and this Delaware Park is where the, the museum sits. Uh, it's a 1905 building that was built for the fair, uh, World's Fair, uh, and the 62 extension done by Gordon Bunshaft, SOM, in the, in the Olmsted Design Park. So it's a heavily charged uh, uh, kind of uh, museum. Uh, our first scheme, which uh, done through a competition, was to create 
and this we thought actually is creating a wall to go through uh, this building to the park beyond. So the idea was to create this kind of uh, Olmsted bridge-like condition where the program goes up and then creates a, a gateway to the park. So almost kind of uh, revealing uh, uh, the Bunshaft's building and creating an atrium below and then a museum above. and then keeping the dialogue between the Bunshaft and the uh, 1905 building, but there's an upper mass and a kind of covered courtyard. So to really minimize the footprint of the intervention so that you don't have to build anything on the park. Uh, after this was announced, there was a kind of heavy protest. You can see here, hire another firm. Um, <laughs> this was a kind of high, kind of <laughs> vicious, He's a rank amateur. Oh. <laughs> no comment, but anyway, we took it seriously. <laughs> so we moved the site. <laughs> um, so instead of here, which uh, we learned that some people really want to preserve, uh, here uh, in the north um, at the parking lot, in the beginning, we thought uh, here it could be a kind of multi-directional building because you're liberated from this kind of heavy history axial building. Uh, so we kind of unwinded the rooms of the 1905 building and made this kind of pine cone-like building with uh, terraces uh, next to each uh, galleries and then a central atria, which we liked. But there are some kind of uh, different comments from a different uh, direction. And uh, in the end, uh, we kind of settled to this project where um, the location is the same. So it's confusing, the, uh, the map is flipped. But on the ground level, there is a, a kind of two directional cross uh, gallery. And then four quadrants, four corners that houses a different program and then the two uh, kind of flexible gallery on top. So there's a kind of room-like uh, condition on the ground and uh, more kind of box, uh, typical box-like condition at the two levels above, which I thought it could, you know, our inspiration was, uh, of course, there are many inspirations, but uh, like uh, Vera Lotonda uh, by, um, uh, um, <laughs> What was it? Uh, <laughs> I always forget. Sorry, Vira pa Paradio, sorry. <laughs> Paradio's uh, Vira Rotonda. Uh, like, it was a kind of a hybrid of the kind of directional cross and the kind of room and the uh, uh, box, which we thought uh, it could be interesting uh, reference because uh, the gallery could uh, sit in the cro at the heart of the building but, also, uh, but to create a, promote an openness, we put different uh, program into the four corners, like loading, uh, gallery, and uh, lobby, and office. And what we did also is to connect the top of the two galleries, and then at the bottom of the ground to create this kind of what we call a, a sculpture court or a promenade around, so that you can actually enjoy the, uh, the park throughout the year without being uh, cold. Uh, so it's a covered, uh, almost like a winter garden that really wraps the building. So you can see here, uh, so there's a double height uh, exhibition space and the four corners that uh, goes, uh, shows its uh, uh, transparency. I think we uh, really wanted to create something completely different to the Bunshaft and the, uh, the 1905 building, which is hermetic and more introverted, here much more extroverted. So you can see here the galleries and the atrium. This is a second level where this promenade really wraps the gallery, so you can always escape to uh, this promenade where uh, many kind of type of different exhibition or gala or different type of activities could happen. It's really a buffer zone between the nature and the art. 
Uh, there's a bridge that connects the existing building to the new building, which is cladded in a kind of highly polished uh, metal and the uh, um, glazing. In 1962 building, we're converting this arm to a, a, a atrium, but also educational wing. And the roof is now designed by Oliver Eliasson. Uh, to uh, it's called Common Sky to really create this kind of spectacle art installation as a roof. Um, we also actually this perineology. Um, we were always interested in in depth how to un uh, to understand the art world more in depth. This study was done in Colombia actually perineology. Uh, it's about how uh, art events are actually inf infiltrating through the world. This is the amount of biennials that are happening in the, in the world currently. So in a given moment, you, there are like 19 uh, biennials happening at the same time. So you can imagine how art events are becoming more and more popular. Um, we also invest, are investigating how art market is shifting. Uh, for example, the art fairs are dominating museum ex exhibitions. Uh, in terms of attendees. So our theory is more like the Bilbao effect where we actually, we, our, my career started like 98 uh, and that was highly affected by Bilbao effect but now I think it's kind of uh, changing into a kind of Art Basel uh, uh, effect where like people are content with tents. And, uh, and I think this is a kind of very dangerous uh, shift for an architect, or maybe you can call it a healthier shift, uh, because uh, the municipalities, of course, don't want to have, or private entities don't want to have too many of a big building, but uh, something more flexible and more uh, uh, mixable with other, other industries. But of course, the experience in those events are highly kind of generic, so I guess we can do something about this. Um, these kind of uh, um, observations led to uh, propose something unique in Miami Beach. Uh, this is uh, in Buenos Aires, in Puerto Madero, where uh, Alan Faena single-handedly made this area as the most expensive real estate in Buenos Aires by converting this former silo to an expensive hotel with Philip Stark. And he came to uh, Miami Beach uh, buying this hotel here, Saxony, and then building a condominium by Norman Foster, but we got these three, two, three sites uh, to do a cultural building. It was kind of, it started as a kind of ballroom, but uh, because of the Miami uh, Beach's art battle effect, we proposed to make something more than a ballroom. So we decided to propose something like this, urban, urban, uh, urban uh, urbanistically, basically, there are two buildings, uh, smaller sites, so we decided to, and one big site, so we decided to create two, uh, four uh, equal volumes. Uh, we also decided to create this one, a kind of center, uh, by creating a kind of round building. And then, in, in the end, made a building that uh, actually is a hybrid of a combination of a square and a cylinder. So you can see this kind of four equal, rather equal volume uh, uh, that this one looks like two buildings, but actually one. Uh, with a plan like this, the square has a black box uh, theater, and this one has, a th of course, an event space, but in a round and a dome. So you have a highly distinct, distinct uh, internal space that are connected that could be used as a, a single space or separate space. So you can open and actually use as a single space, or you can have two simultaneous events. Uh, on this side, you, this is an area that is the creek and the water, the ocean is so close, so we decided to actually connect uh, uh, via big window. So on the black box side, there is a kind of big window uh, that people can use also as a backdrop for the event. Uh, there's also uh, um, a lobby that is also like an amphitheater that is also a third event space. So you can actually have three simultaneous events. Um, we also didn't want to attach a canopy to this kind of pure volume. So we cut the volume and slide the landscape in as an entrance. 
where it became a kind of uh, covered plaza. In order to sustain this cantilever, we basically utilize the facade. So this is a kind of structural facade where there is no column inside, uh, which uh, creates this kind of series of arches uh, as a structure to sustain. Uh, that in the end became almost like an organic kind of palm tree-like pattern or like a seashell-like pattern, which was almost like uh, 300 different uh, type window types which was cast uh, in place. So you can see how close it is to the beach and that appears like a seashell. And while you're going up, basically you have a view to outside. Uh, this was basically during the construction, which client always thought this was a great building because they, you could actually see out from an event space, but he didn't really know that we are building internal wall. Uh, so he was very disappointed when the internal wall was built. Um, so what we did for the opening was uh, a choreography for the uh, uh, dance performance by Pam Tanovitz. So we simulated the shadow movement of the, uh, that opening day uh, and then simulated the shadow, how the shadow could cast through the fenestration if there was no wall into this space and then project mapped that uh, movement as if there was no internal wall that was kind of uh, played together with the dance. And we made this kind of big, um, um, stage with a, a pit that people can go in. How much time do I have? Um, Sotheby's, so um, art world is changing a lot in the so as the auction house. We were lucky to be involved when the, they were really contemplating their own, uh, basically the organizational structure and the business model. And I think the building was, could really reflect that uh, ambition to really change the entity itself. Uh, so of course the auction house used to be a kind of a place where uh, the auction happens, but not really other activities. But nowadays the auction house itself is a multifaceted art entity, art business entity, so they are involved in art fairs, private sales, so they are not no longer just a singular entity. Um, so what we did, and also there are a lot of uh, uh, activities in different locations and also a lot of uh, web uh, utilization for the purchase and the diversification of the goods. Um, this York Avenue building, no one really knows. Uh, this is the headquarters of global headquarters of the Sotheby's building, which sits on the kind of hospital district of 72nd and York. Uh, it's like a pala palazzo, like a big fat building, uh, which they currently are not really utilizing it well because they're, they're basically public function like gallery and the office are completely mixed everywhere randomly, so the vertical circulation is basically not working. So we did the master plan for a year to really restack the building into a workspace, to a storage, and the flex gallery at the, uh, basically all the public function comes uh, at the base, and the kind of sales room as a theater at the center. So currently quite dispersed, is quite clarified. Uh, while they're building, they wanted to use the building while the renovation is happening, so they, we kind of outlined the phasing into kind of seven different phases to achieve the final goal, uh, which was also a very tough uh, uh, negotiation with the basically workers and uh, operations. So the first phase is done, which is to bring all the galleries, public galleries down. So uh, in the future, this will be offices and the, uh, basically this will be the uh, high-end storage. So this kind of public face uh, was brought down. Um, rather than creating a kind of singular big uh, gallery space, which tend to be the kind of typology that, uh, of course, every museum wants, for the flexibility, Sotheby's instead wanted to have a flexibility through diversity because 
their business model is to create a, a unique uh, selling rooms to each uh, potential customers as well as creating this kind of a big exhibition. So they didn't want to have a m turnover time of uh, building temporary walls in big galleries. Rather, they wanted to have multiple different rooms so that they can quickly turn a room into a uh, basically sales room. So we decided to provide a really well, wide range of uh, rooms, like 40 different rooms. Uh, that are clustered differently so they can actually use uh, different clusters uh, for different events and different exhibitions, but each room can be also tailored to a sales room. That ambition, of course, didn't match to the, the, the column grid that existed, so you will see how we decided to actually uh, embrace the column uh, and then expose them as, as a kind of... A, uh, feature of the gallery. Of course, uh, the column is the enemy of the gallery, but we thought in this case actually creates a very unique uh, experience and uh, character to the galleries. Uh, so this is a double height space where we actually reinforce the concrete column so it's very fat on the ground level. Uh, on the second level, where you have a lot of windows towards 72nd Street, that was also a problem before that it was not really visible. and double height space. And here, also another double height space, we reinforce the column again. So you can see the original size and then the reinforced size that are slightly fatter. This is actually open to public uh, anytime, so please go and visit. It's actually quite enjoyable, different experience to a museum because you can actually see the price. Uh, so you really feel like you really see the art in a different way. Also, the density of art is quite unique. As you can see, they're really packed with art, so uh, it's actually quite an uh, in interesting experience. Um, because this, this was a Kodak uh, factory before it was converted by KPF in the 80s, uh, so we decided to actually expose a column and a column cap. Of course, when you're trying to create a dropped ceiling, you will hide a column cap. So we decided to create this kind of cove detail where you expose the column cap uh, while you're finishing the ceiling. And we hatch the column to uh, expose the aggregate. Uh, well, this is just how it was successful. Um, um, I have so many, so I'm going to skip some of them. Um, so this is the uh, first building in LA. I think uh, when I first joined OMA, I was working on a universal headquarters uh, led by Dan Wood, uh, which uh, unfortunately got canceled. Since then, we've been trying so hard to do something in LA. Finally, it is happening, which is an uh, extension of a synagogue in uh, uh, Wilshire Drive. This is existing. A temple, and this was a parking lot where the, there was an international competition to do a gathering space, basically a building focused on gathering. Um, so what we did was to, you took their kind of uh, suggested box and then basically swayed away to create a kind of uh, a gap uh, or uh, a wedged gap to the existing temple to pay some respect and distance. And also, there was a historic school uh, behind, so we also swayed away and instead moved, made a kind of a, a, a parallelogram to the um, um, Wilshire Drive that made also this kind of uh, dynamic shape. So it's actually only two manipulations of the box that uh, created this shape, uh, which we thought in LA where you know a lot of buildings are still quite laconic and kind of basic, uh, we didn't want to over-design the building, so we decided to start from the box and then conceive something unique. Uh, there's uh, three major ex uh, gathering space on the ground that mimics the dome of the, uh, the temple that a lot of program faces down onto. So it's something like this. It's a kind of vault space 
wooden vault space where a lot of events could happen that connects basically the Wilshire Drive to the uh, courtyard of the historic school. So it's almost like a tunnel too, tunnel space. Uh, there are another chapel space that uh, frames the stained glass window of the existing, uh, existing temple that has like half inside, half outside to really kind of enjoy the weather of LA. And then roof is also uh, an event space. So you can actually see this is a highly, uh, almost like a machine of gathering space. And those three voids are interconnected, so you can actually have a, unexpected views through those voids to different uh, uh, moments in the building. And this is a lobby where it's like an Indian well, you go up to each, uh, along the kind of vault, uh, into different uh, level. The facade is inspired by the, uh, the domes, temple's dome space, which is really uh, consists of series of hexagons. So we made a hexagonal one pattern, one unit, which is a hexagon and a single uh, rectangular window that could be rotated according to the program that overall creates this kind of playful pattern. This is a current mock-up, so which is uh, under construction. Um, let me think which one I will present. <laughs> fashion or performance? UIC or fashion? Fashion, fashion week, yeah. <laughs> right on. <laughs> um, Med Costume Institute. Um, this was 2016, and uh, the theme was ma man versus machine, basically the, uh, portraying the, the blurring boundary between man-made and machine-made, basically auto couture and ready-to-wear uh, boundary. So not typically, of course, a fashion exhibition consists of uh, a single designer or single era or single culture. Instead, this one was really about the differences and the similarity of the different times. So our instinct was that this re people really had to focus on the detail of the uh, garments. Um, the site uh, was in the Lehman Wing, luckily, so it was not really a gallery space. This was an atrium and a corridor space. Uh, also, this with Lehman Wing actually sits at the furthest point, but it the uh, kind of central axis of the museum. So you can see there was a full of natural light uh, and it, not even a gallery space where we had to do the exhibition, um, which uh, resulted to think for us to think that we had to create our own environment. Uh, as you know, Met, once you enter, there's a lot of classical language, and especially before you get to the Lehman Wing, there is a, a medieval court where uh, you have also like church-like situation. So we, we were highly inspired by that con context, so we decided to actually create a, a kind of cathedral-like section to cover the existing uh, Lehman Wing, which we called uh, Ghost Cathedral which was covered by the uh, light membrane, translucent membrane. Uh, also to black out the atrium, we pre, uh, put the dome in the center. And we also added the new floor uh, to this kind of atrium so that people can just arrive to this space and then stay in the center, not going down. Uh, so this was a kind of, uh, even if it was temporary, uh, the first time that the Met added any square footage to their building for uh, past, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, 100 years. Um, so they were very nervous. Uh, Susan really helped us to uh, really get through this. Um, so you can see this uh, existing structure, and then the, the intervention was a single uh, circle. And then we use the gap between the structure, existing building, and the gap to create this kind of series of pochets that are uh, basically a space to exhibit. Uh, this is a membrane. It's a kind of uh, a scrim that uh, is typically used for theaters, which uh, becomes very solid when you have a light from the front. But if uh, when you have a light from the back, it becomes very transparent. So overall, it creates a very 
complex uh, trans transparencies. So this is a new floor that we added, and we put the Chanel dress in the center that uh, the pattern was uh, um, projected to the dome, which is in the end a blackout. All the structure was done by a very, of course, off-the-shelf um, scaffolding. It was a very difficult project because it was, we couldn't really prove that this project works. And even like a, a week, two weeks before the opening, it was all scaffolding because we didn't want to start putting the membrane until the scaffolding was done because the membrane was very sensitive. So basically, the, the, at the time, the director President came two weeks ago and thought it was all construction sites still and really freaked out. So it was very difficult to convince that in the end it will be like this, where the scaffolding was all covered by the membrane and creates this kind of transparencies. So this is before, after, before. Um, and one thing we were uh, focused on was not to use too many video screens because we thought nowadays fashion exhibitions tend to overuse monitors and show catwalk pictures too much that we thought it will uh, distract people's attention to really focus on the garments itself. So we did use the uh, uh, media, but only in, well, in the way that uh, uh, integrated to the architecture, so it's project mapped to each pochette and only showing the detail of the garments. So no uh, flat screens. <laughs> Media gets turned on and off so you can see the translucency of this pochette. So when it's not on, you can actually see the garments behind. Every designer had to actually make a centerpiece for the gala night, as you know, the, one of the biggest event of the, of the universe. Um, <laughs> so I had to present uh, to um, Anna Winter. As you can see, it was not really a successful meeting. <laughs> in, the, in the beginning, she eventually took her uh, sunglasses off. Uh, this was uh, uh, the double spiral we kind of designed. One is uh, actual flowers, the other was laser cut flowers to really simulate the man versus machine. This was the kind of version that they delivered, unfortunately. <coughs> but what was kind of amazing was that we designed the, cat, uh, the red carpet together with this that actually spills onto the red carpet, which we thought it will never happen. Actually, it did happen. Um, and it was um, reported as highly distracting red carpet <laughs> because there are three colors. But we thought, actually, if you look at the pictures, it's actually highly successful because there is this kind of round part in the center where people thought, celebrity thought that that's a point to stand. <laughs> This is like perfect, like hiding. <laughs> so, 
Uh, after that, we designed the Dior exhibition in Denver, which uses a metal panel to reflect. Can I just present one more thing? Um, so this is the end. Um, mixed use, I think uh, when I'm teaching here or in, in any universities, nowadays mixed use is such a kind of common uh, project. And mixed use often actually avoids really confronting with the specificity of each program. So I think it's a very dangerous uh, path where you know, of course, a lot of colors in the section always looks great, but actually none of the pro none of the program is actually well thought out. And I think that's a tendency that is happening in the school, but also in reality. Uh, not to mention it was Rem who actually discovered or publicly stated the potential of high rise having different program in the downtown athletic club. Uh, also, the increasing land value simulation, of course, shows that the land values goes up in the center of any given city. Of course, the hybrid, hybridization of program happens. Um, this is a uh, city of Tokyo, which uh, rep is big enough to uh, have different characters uh, of the city or towns represented by different colors here, which you, uh, if you compare that to a dinner table, it's like a la carte style, uh, kind of uh, exciting uh, dinner, which uh, you have, you know, conversation uh, um, stimulator uh, of uh, basically different dishes. Nowadays, there are a lot of uh, big uh, uh, commercial uh, mixed-use building that are uh, developments that are happening also in Tokyo. For example, this one, Roppongi Hills and Mid Tokyo Midtown, has have exactly the same kind of ingredients. Uh, so basically, people tend to follow the success of the other to actually deliver a similar uh, kind of a programmatic constellation, which uh, we call it a bento box uh, project. Which, uh, of course, in a single container, you have. Uh, different program, but it's always the same. So <laughs> what used to be more kind of dynamic and different in terms of experience in the city, there are a lot of bento box in the city that uh, actually creates a kind of uh, uh, predictability to the city. <laughs> so rather, we are, we as an architect asked by the developer to design through different facade, different shapes, uh, uh, exciting building, but if the program is the same, basically the experience will be the inherently, inherently the same. So what I'm saying is that as an architect, we should uh, think of a way to actually be engaged in the programming uh, too. And I think uh, this is not just Tokyo, but it's happening everywhere. And I think that uh, this is a project that I'm doing in Tokyo. Uh, this is a final project. Um, this is a 260 meter tower next to a three existing towers. It's at the Tokyo Bay Area and close to Tokyo Tower. Um, this is in the new axis coming from a new Olympic that is happening next year. Uh, this boulevard is actually a former uh, boulevard that was planned by MacArthur when the Japan lost the war, basically MacArthur drew this line to actually connect the Bay Area to the American Embassy that remained uh, now as a kind of uh, a new boulevard, ironically, a new axis for the Olympic. Um, Mori Building has been building many towers since Roppongi Hills, so now it's not just a freestanding Roppongi Hills Tower, but they have been building many towers. So, our site actually sits at the junction of three zones that uh, they are planning to develop. So what, what we thought is that this, our tower, could be the one that connects different towers, not just the kind of freestanding tower. Because this new axial condition, that activity in green actually continues, uh, which, you know, in, in the city of Tokyo, it's really rare to have a notion of axis because it's uh, quite chaotic in terms of its grid. So rather than a tower that uh, connects, uh, doesn't really connect itself, we uh, kind of emphatically connected uh, the tower through a, a bridge park. 
so that this tower actually connects the uh, axis and then draw activity in green and then create a network through uh, different Mori towers. That's how we present it. Uh, so you can see here, uh, this is existing plinth with a park. There's a par bridge park that penetrates through the center of the tower uh, like this. Uh, in order to achieve this, we are moving the central core to the side core at the sky lobby so that the park can actually go through the dead center of the park, at the center of the tower, which we thought it was very important because the public space actually claims uh, the center of the tower, which of course typically uh, occupied by the elevator cores. So this is a central area where the park actually penetrates through. Of course, there are retails on the both sides, but this is a public uh, space. And that axis actually goes up and then uh, make uh, each program sp uh, has a special program in the center so that this axis is actually visible from everywhere in Tokyo. So you can see here, this is a model uh, that Vincent actually made. Um, you can see one side, it's a shape that one side is uh, this kind of pyramid shape. The other side is the opposite of that and the center is basically uh, connecting those two shapes. Um, and there is a new metro station that uh, is underground, so it's also connected to uh, the network of the Tokyo Metro network. And for the first time, Tokyo Metro can actually have this kind of big uh, uh, um, underground plaza when they uh, get off. And at the top, uh, as you know, Roppongi Hills also has a museum. Here we are also proposing some kind of a media museum slash gallery where it's focused on media and business uh, and, and so on. And at the, uh, at the top, uh, uh, a park uh, and also an infinity pool, not as big as the Singapore, but a kind of tiny pool that uh, overlooks the Imperial Palace. So you can see this uh, new axis that goes vertical, a park and the connection uh, through different towers that Mori, Mori is developing. Uh, thank you. Sure, that was an amazing trip. Thank you. Sorry, I'm <laughs> no, I, too excited. I, my, so. my, my favorite part is the scrolling through the 100 projects you were going to skip tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was really an incredible lecture and just amazing to see uh, the work, not just how much work, but the quality of the work, the diversity um, of the project, the scale. Um, and you started the lecture sort of by reminding us that even if OMA in a way launched a certain idea of the diagram that the work uh, of the office um, moved well beyond the diagram and I think uh, you insisted on the notion of beauty, but you know, as I saw the work uh, beyond beauty, it's also just sheer um, expression of every single element, whether it's structure, or material, layers, programs, right? There's this kind of accumulation uh, and, and excess of uh, kind of contrasting aspects that come together, and it's incredibly complex and three-dimensional and, and certainly not diagrammatic. And I was interested to see how that line of thinking, you know, produced sort of new areas like the bridges, uh, which is just, you know, taking, taking, you know, an aspect that has always been, you know, the building as a series of bridges, but now literally the exploration of the bridge itself. Um, incredible bridges and really beautiful kind of inventions. Uh, and then, and then, kind of bringing back the bridge to buildings, uh, the building as bridge, but this time not just as a stack of uh, of cantilevered, you know, beams, but rather sort of bridging different parts of cities and uh, taking the kind of thought process on preservation, but seeing how much of the office now is not just taking the metropolis as context, but literally another architect's building. Um, as site and how much work you're doing uh, in terms of kind of this conversation and these additions and um, also seeing the kind of at the at the opposite or, or rather 
um, a lot of the projects um, are exploring the envelope in a new way, and the sort of skin and the wrapper, you know, the, even, even in the last Met exhibition, right, mm -hmm. the kind of beautiful where you, you have it both ways, right, the expression of structure, but also the, the kind of form. And so I guess, I guess I'm just sharing some thoughts because I could see some kind of continuity, but I could also see some new trajectories, and I was curious, having grown with the office, and uh, if you, you know, what, what do you feel is most, um, you know, re re results, I mean, is, is, is about this continuity and where you see these kind of moments of change or invention, or uh, how do you uh, read that kind of evolution? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, the diversity that you're mentioning is becoming our weakness, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Because I think when we are actually competing, of course, architecture is not only about the competition, but when we are in a, our generation where you know, the, the complexity that uh, REM and OMA had been delivering is no longer possible to actually uh, um, deliver in the way that uh, we were mm -hmm. delivering. So I think we really have to um, invent a way of communication and a way of designing and also telling the design that is not um, the way that Oma has been doing. Like a kind of heroic and also always challenging the typologies mm -hmm. and so on. Of course, we have that essence of those things, but um, we are, of course, focused in building. We are also focused in those observations that are in, that interests us, um, and that hopefully creates a, a kind of zeitgeist that is that wasn't really possible by Rotterdam. Um, and I think, of course, New York had a different moments since 2006, but I think we are finally finding the luxury to really think ourselves and to define what we are, even beyond OMA. Uh, otherwise, our office becomes a little too laborious still to uh, understand even internally and also uh, externally. Um, of course, the diversity is great, but you know you can also say we are completely out of focus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I also want to hear from different people that uh, I respect um, how they think about it, because of course e each project is great, but what is our you know main message or main uh, goal mm -hmm. as as OMA New York, but also as me as, a, as an architect? Well, that's a very big question, but I... You're I, the first uh, one Yes, I'm the first one, too. I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I, I think... Well, I'm interested in this. Since the office was so much a result of a set of conditions, I mean, of course, with someone who actually, you know, sees conditions in a very particular way, but I'm interested in your... Uh, comment that the kind of complexity uh, that was able to be produced and maybe was appropriate to a certain time in Rotterdam is no longer of our time today. I was, in, you know, and maybe in New York. So is that is that context in itself enough um, to produce a different kind of trajectory here for the office? You think it's a uh do I kind of self-excuse that the complexity cannot be communicated? Because you start your own office after OMA and probably you understand how tough REM was, you know, always to create such a radical directions, persistent on, you know, newness and radicality, um, which really is, you know, difficult in terms of business and also as a stamina, you know, I can't, you know, keep up with it, so <laughs> is it me who is thinking that uh, using the kind of time as an excuse to not to deliver that, or you think it's actually changing? No, I, I, I think, it, I I think it can be a different form of discipline. I, I mean, that's what was always interesting. I remember 
uh, when we did the Prada exhibition, there were two teams, uh, the Prada team and the Herzog and the Meron team. The Prada team was 20 people all night producing foam models. It was a complete mess. And the Herzog and the Meron team had sent two people. They showed up at five and they, at nine, they were done at five and it was exquisite. So I think it's just a, it's a process of a, of a particular, you know, um, but, but certainly, I mean, just looking at the work um, tonight, there were, I mean, if I, you know, the new museum or the, um, by the way, the Albright Knox Museum is, you know, really beautiful. The bridges are, you know, incredibly intelligent in their kind of, there's a sort of simplicity to them, but they're very complex. And I, I think it's a, um, an, an efficiency of means is, is in a different form of discipline. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe we idealized the, <laughs> the chaos, but. Well, I guess, you know, when we were studying, Rem was highly inspirational, and well, Rem still is maybe, but it, to the younger generation, are we inspirational? And if I were the student, probably I won't say so, but. Um, well, the auditorium is pretty full tonight, so show, show you're doing no, okay. But, uh, it's just a curiosity, but is, right. is this inspirational? Or, I don't know, Fujimoto might be more inspirational. You know, so I don't know if our role is, mm -hmm. has shifted uh, from, you know, Rem's era, who was, of course, very focused on giving inspiration to the, to the industry. Um, but now we are instead building more, but you know, less inspirational. That's a kind of, of course, a dilemma that we have. And that's a kind of, uh, of course, and this dilemma actually, we, I, personally, I kind of stopped thinking about it because, of course, I can never be Rem. So um, I, of course, carry the eth ethos of uh, OMA, but, we had to be ourselves to mm -hmm. continue. So uh, that's where we are. And as I said, we are really looking back uh, the production of past 12 years now and then really trying to understand um, the, the, you know, our chain of thoughts. Well, I would say that um, a lot of the kind of art and cultural institutional work, uh, you know, is quite, specific maybe to New York and wasn't so strong um, at the time. That's a kind of difference. But I also think that students today are asking different kinds of questions. They are not just asking um, how do we innovate formally or materially or how do we reinvent the discipline or there's a lot of questions about how do we actually survive and reinvent the practice mm -hmm. of architecture and you know what, what does it mean to practice? How does one practice? Uh, what are the ingredients that architects have at their disposition? And uh, you know, it was very interesting to me that you claimed that you know we should stop saying that it's not important to build anymore and kind of leave it to everyone else and reclaim maybe the importance of the, the you know the building. That's kind of one 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 possible position where I think a lot of uh, questions are around whether architectural practice needs to be about building, and you know that, that would be a clear distinction. So I also think that the questions have changed, and mm -hmm. um, the idea that you're building a different kind of practice with, uh, you know, is also, has an, it's a different kind of form of innovation in a way. Yeah. Well, only thing I can say is that it's still exciting for younger generations to start with. Of course. There are a couple, many Columbia grads in the office now. Good, keep They're hiring mostly. them, please. <laughs> They're mostly kind of leading projects, so. Um, well, on this, on this, I would just want to ask one, one last question and then open it up. You know, I, I, one of the, let's say, interesting part about, you know, this sense of, you know, taking over a sort of body of work and, you know, is that you, 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 you kind of articulate the history uh, of the, of the, of the office better than the office itself, and suddenly there are words that I don't think um, that have emerged, like observation uh, before research. You know that, that there's a difference between the two. 
and representation, which was never a word that was mentioned, is not, but yet it was always clear that there was a kind of rep representational mm -hmm. um, project, both kind of aesthetic and visual, but also in terms of you know identity, etc. That these two poles are kind of clearly articulated is quite interesting. And I just would ask, I mean, it's a little bit the same, like what, what do you have today as observations on the, the future of architecture? I mean, what would be some of the questions that, or answers or observations that you have found? And um, Yeah, it's hard to say in a single observation, but those things like a, how the mixed use is becoming mm -hmm. the dominant typology or the landscape and architecture integration and how architects should actually deal with the landscape mm -hmm. uh, as a means to communicate. Um, I didn't show today, but uh, what I did uh, in GSD about the food research, food mm -hmm. as a catalyst to really look at the world's change, the global change and also the typological change. Um, those things, you know, it always starts with a kind of slight kind of uh, hunt level and then cultivate it using this kind of um, uh, intellectual basis like the, uh, the schools to really cultivate those. That's, that's the kind of initiative that the architects can gain and of course, you know, Rem was always very good at that and that, that part uh, we are really trying to continue to come up with something that we are interested in and trying to capture always a moment of change that could influence the evolution of architectural typologies. Mm -hmm. but, so it's hard to say what it is, but you know, the, the only way is to really look at extensively what's happening in the world and uh, come up with those topics that could potentially uh, cover the, um, the or, you know, the future. Hi there. Um, I'm interested in uh, the process sort of that you mentioned in the Albright Knox gallery of releasing a plan and the media responding to it and then you changing your design as a result of the, you know, outside pressure and changing again. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, I'm especially in the current like political climate, I don't trust everything I hear from the media or trust that the feedback I'm being given is necessarily uh, the right path, and I'm wondering what your process is as an office, as an architect, to hear criticism and value it, or to trust the strength of your own decisions, um, you know, in the design. Yeah, maybe it came across that way, but uh, it was a little bit of a joke that uh, that a single tweet actually kind of changed our mind. But let's say this way that. Uh, both us and client had a misunderstanding of how Boonshaft building was loved, how much it was loved, and these um, pro protests actually, we could have gone through it, but uh, the, the, the time and the energy that takes to go through it, we collectively decided that it's not worth it, and we decided to move the site. So it wasn't an easy decision, and it wasn't for sure not just through the pressure of the radical uh, commentators, but uh, it was all for the kind of, it was a collective decision. But yeah, we actually look at those uh, radical uh, comments quite seriously. We monitor them through uh, tweets, and uh, that, that, that person I blocked because he, <laughs> She personally attacked me, but uh, but we, we take it seriously because there are some truth in it, but not necessarily to listen to it. Of course, a firm like us, there are a lot of people who wants to comment something uh, radical. So we are used to it, but at the same time, we are quite serious uh, in acknowledging them. But often these kind of comments happens when there is a limitation on the, the material. I think even like, you know, when that comment came, we only released like 10 slides that showed a kind of radical move, but there was a, a lot more research, a lot more depth into a project, but often of course uh, only a portion of it gets communicated and that 
uh, basically in not knowing actually creates uh, uh, such a superficial um, criticism. But to what extent is the feeling <laughs> of that fragmentation that you talk about, uh, you're a victim of OMA's own success in the sense that a lot of these moves or ideas that were initiated 20 years ago have now become so common and so part of the practice that we, we take them for granted. You know, mm -hmm. that you can't have a building now that doesn't have a stair that's also an auditorium, right? It's become <laughs> like, a, you know, every, every single building has that in some way. And yeah. um, so, so these ideas have so filtered into the consciousness and the way that we think about applying the metropolitan to the architectural that now we see it everywhere. But it's also a, a kind of crisis in that aspect where an architectural practice is so schizophrenic in the sense that every project's different, and so the only thing that can tie them together is the power of your own thought that through them. And trying to find that line, is that something that you can find as you're making the work, but you, or you can only find it retroactively after 12 years to look back and see which projects fit and which ones don't, and then slowly weeding them ones out that don't so that you start to see continuity that way. That you can never see continuity as you're doing it somehow. It's only mm -hmm. uh, in retrospect. I think it's just us um, or me that, of course, I started as of the, as the outpost to continue OMA, and suddenly, you know, we started to do a little bit of an independent direction. That's why this kind of schizophrenia or like OMA but not OMA still exists, but now we are completely focused on not OMA, but not successfully yet, as you were saying, like we often discuss in the office, please don't do typical OMA as, as a kind of starting point because we still see what we only see our evolution in that way, as opposed to maybe the outposts, oh no, sorry, the, the offices that spawn from OMA maybe has more kind of luxury, not luxury, but more, it probably easier to continue what OMA has been doing because they kind of can envelope in their own trajectory. But here we have to be even more critical about typical OMA move and typical OMA material selection. Um, but it's not successful yet. But we are discussing that. Uh, and I don't know the way to achieve it unless you really completely change the way we work or the way we start, like, okay, material or something else, like, as you mentioned, like Herzog and Domron. So, but that's also, I don't know, almost like throwing everything that we learned, but I guess that's, that's the only way. Or is it, is, it a, is it the moment we're in now where that sense of mission or heroism is missing somehow? Do you see that as a, as a general condition or as a specific condition to yourself? Mm, I think in, in general it's, it's like that a little bit, but some people don't really have to, <coughs> are not shy of doing things, so they are quite powerful offices if they don't think too much like we're <laughs> <laughs> thinking. Stop thinking. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult, but that's why I guess one thing that we are missing is like a sense of collaboration. I think OMA, despite of the dominance of uh, REM, I think there was a, a much more openness to collaborate with other thinkers and other uh, architects and other designers. Now I think we're a little bit insulated and mm -hmm. we don't really have, uh, we are not embracing the power of, you know, collectively thinking about uh, the way we get through the current moment, so. Hi, um, I'm sorry if this is such a, such a gener generic question, but um, speaking of the questions that we're going to be asking in the younger generation, uh, it comes to architecture and practice, um, I think everybody can agree that one of the, our few of the biggest issues are climate change and the energy crisis and so on. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, as a uh, leader in the practice, how do you see the firm going forward with regards to these issues? How you, how you view them, how you are maybe planning to like tackle it, or um, is that just such a um, issue that is so 
embedded in the practice in general that mm -hmm. um, that is not like a, something that you put forward? It's the latter last one, I guess, in our case, that we are actually working with uh, like the post Sandy thing in New Jersey. Um, and many, of course, projects are, you know, sustainable in the kind of checklist level. But we are not really engaging proactively the way the sustainability could be evolved. So we are a little bit maybe not behind, but we are not putting those themes forward as a means to design it. Because par partially because I, I just don't think using those issues as a means to defend your design is not healthy, in my opinion. Like, you know, Bjarke is a big view or whatever. That really come across to me as using the disaster as a means to really radically renovate the urban edge. If in our Jersey, you, you, if you actually carefully model the flood, it really comes down to a couple of points of the streets where the water comes in. You don't really need a kind of big park to prevent the water. So for me, that is actually more better solution to surgically fix uh, those points where the water came in, then imposing a grand vision over the disaster. But that's, that's of course, but we are interested in sustainability and how the energy, energy you know, generation could change the way that the city, work, and, you know, in a much higher level we are maybe interested in. All right, well, um, that was amazing, please, don't worry. <laughs> um, no, it really was um, incredible. And to be honest, it's also incredible that you are asking those questions of the office and what it stands for today. And I think many in your position would, would not. So it's very inspiring that the search continues. Thank you, Sho. Thank you.